ask right now, Father, that, Lord, your anointing be on this uh, message. We ask, yes. Lord, that uh, you be glorified through the message, that you yes. prepare our minds and our hearts to receive what you have for us, Lord. Give us revelation knowledge in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Father, we come before you right now, Lord. We also, we lift up Paul. Uh, we pray your anointing with him. We pray your healing power. Lord, you said healing is in your wings, that by your stripes Amen. we're healed. And you said any two or, or more touching and agreeing on anything, and it shall be done. Amen. And so we're all agreeing for healing and wholeness. Uh, we thank you for uh, Mark's quick recovery yes. and uh, for his strength. And we just pray blessings in Jesus' name. Alright, as I was saying on this, I originally had finished the PowerPoint and it was 114 slides two days ago. And, uh, and at 4 o'clock, God had me change it. Now, instead of doing the five burnt offerings, we are doing the three voluntary offerings. So, Blessing, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olom, asher natan l'sekvi, benat l'hakim, ben yom uben laila. In English, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave the heart of understanding to distinguish between day and between night. Now, we've been through Bereshit, we've been through Shemot, now we are on Vayikra. Um, or as we know, Leviticus. Now, Leviticus is from the Latin. It means the book of the Levites. But, Vayikra, from the Hebrew, what it means, and he called. In the English, that's how it's translated. And he called. In other words, those who were called. The called by God. And so that's what the book is about. And so I think we can really relate to this very well because we also are called by God. And so we're going to Leviticus by Yigra. Now, the outline on the book, the first three chapters that we're going to be covering in here today are going to be the offerings of praise and dedication. Um, the first ten chapters will be about worshiping a holy God, the vital offerings. The... Uh, Chapters 11 to 27 are going to be walking with the Holy God and various obligations. And so this is the Levitical law. It, the place was Mount Sinai. Approximately a month. Basically, this is all the stuff that was taking place at the end of Exodus when we were in that book. And, um, and the author of it, of course, is Moses. And I've got, actually, chapter by chapter breakdown. So chapter 1 is going to be the burnt offering. Chapter 2, the meal offering or the grain offering. And chapter 3, the peace offering. And those are the three voluntary offerings. That's what we're going to be covering today. And then next week, we'll be covering the obligatory offerings. In other words, the mandatory offerings that were usually a fine or a penalty for something that you did. And breaking down the book on it, the first seven chapters are the laws of the offerings. Then we have the laws of the priests, the laws of purity, the day of atonement, the laws of holiness, the laws of the priests, the appointed times, and the penalties and vows. And so, in our this is our third book that we're going through in our series through the Torah. We're just starting Leviticus today. And basically, these are the first five offerings. The first three, you have the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering. And then next week, we'll cover the sin offering and the trespass offering. So, chapter 1, the burnt offering, giving self to God. And so we start out with our burnt offerings. And the Lord called to Moshe and spoke to him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man of you bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. And if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now if you notice, was this mandatory? No, this is voluntary. This was not something you had to do. This is if you wanted to do this. This was an offering that you wanted to do. Okay? And 
that's going to be a big difference. All of the ones we're covering today are going to be voluntary offerings. They are voluntary gifts that are being given. He shall lay his hands on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. And so on these, basically, this was that whole transference where you're transferring your sins over to the animals. And this way, this, by this way, the animal was a picture um, of, of your sins being covered over. He shall slay the young bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood around on the altar that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. So this is where they sprinkled, they'd sprinkle the blood around the, all around the, the corners of the altar. And the sons of Aaron and the priest shall put fire upon the altar, lay the wood in order upon the fire, and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. So these were the burnt offerings that we were doing. If you notice, there's some of the utensils that they used for putting it in there. Nice little cartoon version on it. Now, why an animal sacrifice? In basic rural society, animals are the means of life and wealth. You have to remember on this that this was an agricultural society. So, they're farmers. If they were going to give an offering of their wealth, what was their wealth? Their wealth was going to be their livestock and it was going to be their it was going to be what they grew. That's what their offerings. That's basically what they had to give in terms of their wealth. So, if yes, go ahead. This was all why they were out in the wilderness. Yeah, but this would this continue right on. If you'll notice, most of these, he's going to go on and continue to say this is a permanent statute for all generations. Okay. So it's something that's continual that kept going. So he started it while they were in the wilderness, but it continued right on into the promised land, and it continued right on into the time of the judges, and continued right on into the time of the kings. So what about today? You offer money or? I will get to that. Yeah. <laughs> I will get to that. You know, because that's one of the things that basically I want you to think about is when we, when we turn around and we give an offering or we give a gift, right? We don't turn around and think about it in terms of, um, well, gee, should I do this or why should I do this or is this pertinent for today? Usually none of that is looked at that way. We, there's no reason that we'd say, well, well, should I give an offering or why should I give an offering? You know, when you get into Malachi, he talked about, you know, you rob me. How do you rob him? You rob him in the tithes and offerings. Now, I find it interesting that most of the mainstream church kind of looks at the Old Testament as, oh, well, that was the Old Covenant. <laughs> you know, we don't even look at that. But they hang on to the tithes and the offerings in there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, they never question that the tithes and offerings are for today. You know, but oh, well, all of the other stuff, well, you know, once again, it's smorgasbord Christianity. It's a pick and choose. Well, we want this, but we won't, don't want that. Well, how would we function our church if we didn't have offerings, right? So they look at it from the concept of, well, of course, these are pertinent. God says, look, you robbed me in, by not giving tithes and offerings, you know? And he, he turns around and he, but they look at it and they say, oh, but none of that stuff in the Old Testament mattered or is pertinent today. And as we go through this, what you find is everything in the Old Testament matters and is pertinent today. Now, and God had a specific reason and a method for what he used to do the offerings as he was doing. And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep, or of the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish, and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord, and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. And he shall cut it into pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. 
But he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons, and the priest shall bring it to the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. Now, basically, so this is basically what you have for your offering. It was a bull or a ram or a goat or a dove or pigeon. And these were what were used in the voluntary burnt offerings. Yes, go ahead. Since those have a different uh, level of meaning, or because a bull is a lot bigger than a Yes, they do. Glad you mentioned that. Now, as we know, Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so, as being the Lamb of God, that's what he was looking at as, as the sacrifice. The ram, it, which is obviously not a lamb, it's not a baby, it's a grown-up adult, with two horns. And two is always the number of witness. That's why we have two eyes, two ears. God said you have to have two for a witness over anything, right? And so you have two horns. Horns always represent power. That's why you have four horns on the altars, right? So these two horns are a witness of his sacrifice. Now, he's also depicted as the ox. The Gospel of Mark depicts Jesus as the ox, the servant, right? Because of the domestic animals, the ox is considered the majestic of the domestic animals, and one of the cherubims is depicted by the ox. So basically, it's his servitude. Whereas the lamb is the sacrifice, the ox is a picture of Jesus' service. How he did not his own will, but he basically gave himself as a servant over to everyone. Yes? what I was explaining, because a ram is a grown-up one that has two horns. The horns represent the power, and the two represent the witness, and so it's the witness of the sacrifice. Wait, then, why, um, does it, like, it say, like, Jesus was the witness of the sacrifice, it's this big bull, mm -hmm. and then Jesus is this little lamb. And Jesus lamb. the sacrifice. Why yes. is Jesus like this little lamb? Then, because he went like a lamb to the slaughter. He went without saying a word. Well, then why is this huge bull his servant? Because he also, he also worked like an ox. He was out there constantly giving himself in the service to the Lord, healing people, ministering to people, preaching to people. So he worked very hard like the ox, and he went quiet like the lamb to the slaughter. Good questions. Yes. Oh, good questions. Oh, yeah, one more thing. What yes. was that go on the other side? Like, go on the other side? Alright, we'll end? back up. Now, what's that some, dude doing? Okay, go get back in your seat. You don't walk up here. What's <laughs> that? You can point. We know where the goat's at on there. Okay, now, the goat on it, and some people have a different view on it. I still look at the goat always depicted as Satan, the scapegoat. A lot of people, there's a lot of people, they believe Jesus was the scapegoat. Um, what I notice is that when you look in the scriptures, what you do is you see that throughout scriptures, the meanings usually always stay the same. And God talked about the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And they were depicted as the people that were destroyed and cast into the fire. And so in my view, uh, I believe the goat is a picture of Satan who basically is, is going to take a fall and eventually take blame for, or responsibility for, for what he's done. Yes? What's the scripture where they send the goat out for the scapegoat? Yes, What's that? that's for the Day of Atonement. And actually we'll be getting to that at the end of the message. Oh yeah. Um, the end of this message is actually uh, going to be yeah. leading into next week's Bible study. Where we're, that are going into the sin offering and the tre trespass offering. Oh, and why is the, what, the, why is the goat used for, also for, the, for an offering? For a sacrifice all? Yeah. Because... It, as you look, if you notice, Jesus, when he came the first time, mm -hmm. he came as a lamb to be the Passover lamb, sacrificed. Mm -hmm. The second time, he doesn't get sacrificed. Mm -hmm. The second time, Satan gets sacrificed. 
Now, Leviticus 1, 16 to 17, it says, And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers, and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes, and he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet savor to the Lord. Now, uh, the bull, sheep, goat, young male, unblemished. This is the burnt offerings. Um, the laying out of hands on the head of the bull, the slaughter of the bull in front of the tent, the splash of the blood around the four sides of the altar by the priest, the skin of the bull and cut into pieces, the priesthood tends fire and wood and the altar, the priest arranges the head, the fat, the pieces on the altar, the entrails and the legs of the animal to be washed, the priest caused everything to go up in smoke as a burnt offering. Now all of this was basically where people were sacrificing, giving the offerings over as a free will, voluntary offering where they're making a sacrifice to the Lord. And every aspect of it had, yes, now you can't be asking questions to the whole thing, but we're never going to get to the Bible study. Why? Because other people are going to want to ask questions too. And it can't be just you asking questions all day. Why does it have to be a young male? Well, because Jesus is depicted as the bridegroom, so he's the male. Whenever it's depicted as the female, it's usually the bride of Christ that it's depicting. But we're going to get into that another time. We'll be getting into that later on in the book. Not tonight. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears have you opened, burnt offering and sin offering have you not required. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, yes, your law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation, lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, you know. I have not hid your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness, your truth from the great congregation. Now I go back on this. Now, when you, when you look at the psalm on it, one of the things I think that people have a tendency to kind of miss a lot of times, when they look at the offerings that's being done, they have a tendency to miss the attitude of heart that's implied behind it. That you're going, that you're looking towards giving something voluntary to God because you want to basically show, you know, your appreciation for what God's done for you. Mm -hmm. And David, who wrote the Psalms, had, um, was a man after God's own heart. He had the right heart and attitude and appreciation in what he did. David was the one that said, God forbid I should give anything to God that doesn't cost me. You know, when you look back at that widow's mite who threw in the mite, and Jesus said, she gave more than anybody here, and they're like, she threw in a mite. That was it. Yeah, but she gave 100% of everything she had. Now, I like this little, I like the little comic strips on it. It says, uh, that's interesting. What? People used to try to influence their gods with burnt offerings of some kind of an animal. Hmm. Why'd they burn it? Because that meant they couldn't eat it, showing how much respect they had for the gods, who, who would then reward them with good crops or something like that. He says, wow, I never realized Dad was so religious. <laughs> now, this concept and this attitude and idea that's on here... It's just that. It's a religious attitude and idea. You know, um, we, we don't want to be called religious. We don't want to be religious. Religious is probably uh, what I consider the farthest thing from God. Because God doesn't want religion. He doesn't want man's attempt to get to Him. He wants a relationship. He wants a personal, intimate relationship with us. You know? And... The problem is, most of the time, people would rather have religion where there's not so much of a commitment. See, a relationship actually means a commitment. It actually means, kind of, you actually have to put a little bit more in on a relationship. Whereas in religion, if it's just 
a religious act that you're doing, people would really kind of prefer that because it's a little less personal. So we don't want to be religious, right? We don't want to do things for religious reasons. We want to do things because we have a heart for God and we love Him and we recognize that He loved us first and we appreciate that love. And so we want to be obedient to God because we love Him. All right, moving to the grain offering. Uh, the grain offering was to give thanks to God. And see, this is one of the things a lot of times people would say, oh, well, see, you, you have, like when they look at Cain and Abel, I've heard people say, well, see, Abel sacrificed of his flock, and there had to be a shedding of blood because God wasn't going to honor a sacrifice without the shedding of blood. And the problem with that attitude is, well, God had also accepted grain offerings for Thanksgiving. You know? Now, in the grain offerings on it, basically, you know, part of one of the jobs that the priest had in this was that they were supposed to inspect the animals. They were supposed to inspect the crops. It, your crops were supposed to be five, four years going through for producing fruit so that they had full fruit. If they had not been fully produced, the priests were supposed to be able to examine this and, and see. And so part of their job was they were food inspectors. And when they did this, they got a portion of that offering <coughs> towards them to go for what they did as their work for as <coughs> food inspectors. If you had a diseased animal, obviously they're not going to let that go through. It's going to get quarantined, and this protects everybody. If your crops are not properly, you know, if, if they're not properly brought to the fruition of where they need to be for crops, they're not going to, it's not going to be helpful for the, for the crops or the people or anybody else. And so part of their job was the examination of it. And when any will offer a meat offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon, and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take there out of his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar, to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy, the offering of the Lord made by fire. And if you bring an oblation of a meat offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And if your oblation be a meat offering baked in a pan, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mingled with oil. Now, you notice the common factors about the grain offering. They're all unleavened. Why, what does leaven represent? Sin. Sin. So basically, since all of these offerings are usually directing and pointing as a picture of the Messiah, to put leaven in there was going to basically depict it as him being sinful. So this, this was to depict basically that he was without sin and anointed with oil. What does oil represent? The, Holy Spirit. the anointing of God. So basically, he had the fullness of the anointing and he was without sin. And so this picture of unleavened bread with oil is a picture of the Messiah who was without sin and had the fullness of the anointing. And you shall part it in pieces and pour oil there on it. It is a meat offering. Jacob, the table keeps shaking. Okay, get your feet over here. There you go. Thank you. And if your oblation be a meat offering baked in the frying pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil, and you shall bring the meat offering that is made of these things to the Lord, and when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and he shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons, it is a thing most holy of the offering of the Lord made by fire. Now, 
Now, no meat offering which you shall bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in any of the offering of the Lord made by fire. As for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. So if you notice, well, let me go back real quick. You know, like I said, once again, he's making an adamant claim about that you're never to burn leaven on this sacrifice. That the, the sacrifice is always to be unleavened, as I said, because it's representing the Messiah. It's to be anointed with oil. There's never to be any honey on it, because honey was for sweetness. And when you look at the pictures you get of the Messiah, when he came, um, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So the picture was to keep it the picture of his first coming that he came in with. And as for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar as a sweet savor. So you're not going to burn the first fruits of the offering that are coming. If you remember, the first fruits was going to be just a basket to be offered up in the beginning. And this was the first fruits that came. Now Jesus was the first fruits in the resurrection. And you always have a first fruit comes before the harvest does. And every oblation of your meat offering shall, shall you season with salt. Neither shall you suffer the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your meat offering. With all your offering you shall offer salt. And if you offer a meat offering of your first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the meat offering of your first fruits green ears of corn, dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. So they did have corn back then. And this is all to be done with salt. And he tells us in Matthew 5 that we're the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its seasoning, what's it good for? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out on the ground. And you shall put oil upon it and lay frankincense therein. It is a meat offering and the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof, and it is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now frankincense was usually associated with kings, with royalty. So you have that picture when Jesus came of the three gifts that, that they brought. They brought gold, myrrh, and frankincense. Wise men. That's right, the wise men. And, Jake, hand up. Um, and the frankincense was representing for his royalty. The, as I mentioned before, where I talked about gold representing deity, and the myrrh for his for his burial. I threw my picture of corn in. Um, it's interesting too because you see that a lot of times. Yes, go ahead. because his death is sweet. It was sweet for all those who believe in him. That's, That's true. Yes. Yet we're not supposed to throw any honey in with the. <laughs> hey, Jacob, Jacob, move over to the other chair, okay? Actually, I prefer you over on this side. I don't need that close to your brother. Either go back in the other room or sit over here. Come in. Hurry up. Thank you. Yes, Mark. So this corn, tell them how to do this. Um, so they would have corn in Egypt. Um, for 40 years, unless they bought corn somewhere, they wouldn't have it. So right. he was figuring this was when you did get to um, Israel and promised sit down and would start doing that. So for a long time, they didn't, unless what they, unless what they took out of Egypt, they didn't have corn. Because Most of it, you got to remember in the wilderness, there was nothing out there. Right, there was nothing. There was nothing out there. What they had was what they brought from Egypt when they, when they plundered Egypt. And if you looked at it, that's exactly what they did. They plundered Egypt. And it says that they took the wealth of Egypt with them, and that's how they made all the articles for the tabernacle. That's how they made, um, that's how they did everything. The vehicle sacrifices, the meal offering, the rules in the offering. Uh, no meat offering which you shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. You shall burn no leaven or any honey. They shall not be burnt on the altar. Neither shall you suffer the salt lacking from the meat offering. And salt was both a preservative and a seasoning. It added both flavor and it preserved. Another comic. 
No, dear, Leviticus 1 and 2 was not intended as an outline for a cookbook. <laughs> the sacrifice of the peace offering. Now, the third one that comes in is the peace offering. And um, basically, the idea behind this is making peace before God. The difference on this, on the peace offering, is that the peace offering was basically... Um, the offering went both to the priest and to the person that brought the offering. And if his oblation was a sacrifice of a peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord, and he shall lay his hands upon the head of his offering, and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. <clears throat> And this, we already covered this before, the laying on of hands, the sprinkling of the blood on the altar. That without the sprinkling of blood, without the blood, there's no atonement for sins whatsoever. And he shall offer the, of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord, the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, and with the kidneys, it shall be he take away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of sweet savor to the Lord. But if his offering for the sacrifice of the peace offering to the Lord is from the flock, he shall offer it male or female without defect. Leviticus 3, when it said, out of the herd, the cattle, whether male or female, he shall offer it. So you had it where they're pulling it from the flock for the peace offering. And as if, if his offering is a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord, be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. A lot of blood sprinkling of blood. So to lay the hands, it's the transference of the, you know, uh, on, onto the, the animal. Which, if you're looking at this, this is all voluntary offerings. None of this is required or mandatory. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord, the fat thereof, the whole rump, it shall take off hard by the backbone, and the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. Now, the Israelites had to be skilled butchers. One of the things that's going on here, and a lot of times people are going, oh my God, killing a poor animal, right? <laughs> well, we go to the we don't work on a farm anymore here. We don't live on farms, so we go to the supermarket, and the meat's already been cut. And we take it home, and we cook it. You know? A lot of times people look at this, and they, they miss the point. It's a barbecue. That's what it is. It's a barbecue. Right? And... People that lived on farms and grew up on farms, and this was an agriculture society, this was very common to them. It was not a really elaborate thing to kill an animal for a barbecue. And it's not like they did it inhumanely. No. As a matter of fact, that was the whole point of them bringing it to the priest, because the priest would kill it humanely. They had the correct way to do it. They would analyze it and make sure that it was healthy and that there was nothing wrong with it, so that if it was diseased then you've got a problem where a disease is going to spread out throughout there. So they're performing the job of both food control and butcher. Makes sense. And because of this, they get a portion of the meat. A lot of times you have something butchered, some of the butchers will take as payment a portion of the meat for their payment. This is no different. This is where that came from. So basically when you look at the peace offering on this, this is their payment for butchering the meat. They're examining the meat, they're butchering the meat, and they're getting their payment for it. And it's helping to support the priests that do the work of God. Chauncey. Yes. How many would they get in a day? Or is it one day and all of these are there? I'm just... Normally, see, normally it, you're, they're not going to be over flooded with it, except three times a year. Right. 
Right. So that's why when we, and I'm not even touching on this right now, but you had the casting of the lots according to the tribes to go to when which members of the tribe would come and serve in the temple. But at Passover time, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, where you had all these offerings coming in, all the priests had to come in and work that day. So when they had the bulk of the offerings that were coming in all of the time for the holy days, where God said three times a year your men are going to come here and they're not going to come empty handed. That's when all the priests were working because they needed all the priests just to be able to handle the, the load of how, much, uh, of, how many, of how many offerings were coming in. Yes? Do you know if the priests you know the priest would take part of their payments? Obviously, they didn't have refrigeration and give it to people who were lesser who didn't have anything to offer. Maybe. Well, part of it, that's what you got to understand. When this was given as offered, the, the priest portion was considered holy. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was going to the priests and to the priest's families and the members of the families. And so this is what was being provided for the clergy, so to speak. Um, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is food for the offering made by fire to the Lord. And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hands upon the head of it, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. So they would lay the hands on once again. Sprinkle the blood. <coughs> And he shall offer thereof his offering, even an offering made by fire to the Lord, the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor, all of the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither the fat nor the blood. So God's telling us not to eat fat or blood. So don't eat that rare steak and all the blood dripping out. Okay. Well, you know, usually a lot of it had to do with how it's killed. You know, um, they would drain the blood from it when they were killing it. And like I said, God had them killing it the most humane way it was. They would slit the throat and let it bleed out. There's a lot of inhumane ways they kill animals, and they're usually not as healthy to eat that way either. Yes? And that, when you eat a steak and you see that red stuff coming out, that's not the blood. It's no. a dye that's in there. Because I had that big thing, I wouldn't eat a meat, you know, rare or anything and stuff. Then oh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, no, the <laughs> chef told me that that's not blood. So. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's not. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, it's a preservative, so that's a familiar intent. All right, so the peace offerings. <laughs> Basically, it would be sheep, goats, rams, bread. Um, basically, it was making peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. And there are three types of peace offerings. To give thanks to the Lord, um, to fulfill a vow, to volunteer an offering in a sense of gratitude or consecration to God. So these are the three ways that you gave peace offerings, but um, a large part of this was basically um, part of the culture for getting the, you know, for getting their food butchered, and 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 they would do their offerings with God. They'd be supporting the the priests and so on. What's that? Just go back. Oh, back. Oh, I'm sorry. Isaiah 1.10 says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bulls or the lambs or of the he goats. Well, who, who, who's the one that commanded to do the offerings? He did. God did. So obviously, it isn't that he doesn't want the, cup, the, the offerings, there's something more to it. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? 
Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. Well, who commanded the Sabbaths? Who commanded the new moons? God, God did. So what, what, what's he talking about? Well, he says, Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Basically what he's saying is, the offerings mean nothing. If you if you if you're not don't have a, a right heart with God, if you're not in right standing with God, if, if you're going around and doing evil, and then you're turning around and you're giving an offering to God and thinking you're okay, you're not. Yes. You know it's funny. I just got a picture. John said, you know, it's like, what if a guy comes home and and has a really good relationship with his wife, and he always brings her flowers and all that. Things are going well. That would mean a lot, and it would be real positive. But if if she knew he was having an affair, right, and he's bringing flowers, yeah, it's, it's not going to carry the, a lot of weight. It's not the flowers <laughs> that are bad. No, what I'm saying yeah. is not the flowers that are bad. It's right. a disgusting thing to the Lord for us to sit there and, and give phony gesture to Him, but yet not actually be doing what it means. Yeah. He says, "If you love me, you keep my commandments." Right. And, and he talks about the weightier things of the law being love, mercy, compassion. But it's important to think that because a lot of people take this out of context. Right. And say, see, he doesn't want you to do the new moons and this and that. And the offerings. Yes. Right, which is totally out of context because it's in the same Old Testament books that he commanded you to do them and that they were permanent statutes. But what he's saying is, what good is it if your heart's not right? He goes on to say, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you will be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So he's talking about an attitude where he's saying, look, if you're going to be obedient, I'm going to bless you. But if you're going to continue to re rebel and refuse to do what you're told, he says, you're going to get devoured by the sword. Everything is usually set on cause and effect with God. He said, if you keep these, I can't wait till we get to Deuteronomy, because then we get to cover on, if you keep these words that I said, here's all the blessings. Then he turns around and says, if you don't keep these, here's all the curses. And you can see them perfectly in the United States here, where the more obedient we were, we had the blessings of God. And as we've turned away from God, we've been running more into the curses. Hebrews 8, 1 to 3, he says, now, of the things which you have spoken, this is the point. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of the necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. So he's basically saying, look, he's also got to be able to give sacrifice. He's a priest, even though we have a perfect high priest now, he still has to make offerings. It says, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve to the example in the shadow of heavenly things, as Moshe was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says he, that you make all these things according to the pattern shown to you in the mountain. So in other words, the, the earthly tabernacle was modeled off of something from heaven. And our high priest who is now in heaven is actually ministering on our behalf in the heavenlies. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also... He is the mediator of a better covenant, 
which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, if you notice, this is with the house of Israel. That's why I tell people, when people say, oh, but I'm not Israel. I says, well, <laughs> I don't know if you want to go there, because the covenant, the new covenant that God made was with the house of Israel. And if you were adopted in through the line of Yeshua, or Jesus, then you are both a Jew through the line of Judah through Jesus, and an Israelite through the line of Jesus, and a priest through the line of Melchizedek. And when you go through it, if you'll notice, he's putting the law on their minds and writing it on their hearts. That law, the law that he's given here, is the same law he's put, putting it in their minds and he's writing it on their hearts. So that they will know it and so that they will love it. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be a merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers there too, too perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Now if you notice on this, he's talking about what? Sins. Would the offerings that we covered earlier having anything to do with sins? No, they were free will offerings. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, why is he saying every year? What's every year in reference to? Passover. No, Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. Once a year, you would bring into remembrance your, the sins for the atonement for the entire nation. That we're to be atoned for. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering would not, you would not, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book is written of me, to do your will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sins, you would not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Why? Because what is it that God wants from us? Obedience. <laughs> to do your will, O God. That's what he wants from us, to do his will. In other words, the offerings do no good. It doesn't matter if you give your body to be burned and you don't have love. Right? What he wants, he wants an attitude of heart. He wants obedience. Then he's ready to receive the offering. That's why he says, look, if you have anything against a brother, don't bring your offering to the altar. First, make it right with the person that you have a problem with. Then bring your offering back to the altar. So what God's talking about is because unforgiveness in your heart is basically keeps you out of a right alignment with God. You're out of relationship with God if you have <laughs> unforgiveness in your heart. And God wants relationship. The offerings mean nothing to Him 
without the relationship first. It's like he depicted, that Lucky made an, a perfect example of that, right? Your wife wants to be in good relationship with you first before you bring her the flowers. If she's mad at you, the flowers aren't going to be as appreciated as much. Then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua the Messiah once and for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that that he had said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And their sin and iniquity I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, when did the high priest enter into the holiest? The holy of holies. The only time was once a year at the Day of Atonement. So what is this referring to then? as we're going where it talks about the remembrance once a year of sin and being able to go boldly into the Holy of Holies, it wasn't talking about burnt offerings, especially not voluntary offerings. It was talking about an atonement for sin that Jesus paid for us on the cross, which was not all the burnt offerings. It was the atonement for sin that came on when? The Day of Atonement. <coughs> by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, talking about the veil into the Holy of Holies, that is to say his flesh. So it's relating that veil between the holy place and the Holy of Holies with the flesh that he took on when he came down here. And having a high priest over the house of God, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say the flesh, and having a... I think I just read this. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we need to hear it twice anyway. <laughs> At least I'm repeating it. It must have been worth reading twice. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, this is what it's really talking about right here. Because the attitude, this is the attitude of heart that God wants us, to let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, because we are saved by what? Faith. By faith. Now, did Jesus die on the cross for everybody? Yes. yes. So is everybody saved? No. No. It says the just shall live by faith. In other words, the only ones that are saved are those that receive it by faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke to love and to good works. Now, a lot of times they say, well, you know, you know, your salvation doesn't come by good works. You're right. It doesn't. Our salvation is a free gift from God. So why are we doing good works? Love and good works should be the automatic outpouring that comes in our sanctification. In the life of Christ that we are molding in us daily. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The 
day of the Lord, the return of the Messiah. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. He's saying, look, if, if we've been forgiven and we're willfully sinning, living in sin, there's no sacrifice that's going to cover that. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite to the Spirit of grace. That's a, that's, you stop and think about that. What he's talking about here, he's saying, with, with what Jesus did for us on the cross, for the price that he had to pay for us, for us to just trample all over that by just saying, oh, well, we can just go ahead and sin. We're under grace. That we are trodden underfoot the works of the Messiah that he did for us. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Notice he's not talking about the heathens there. He says, where it says, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Very fearful. <laughs> now, the three we covered right now were the voluntary offerings. That was the burnt offering, the peace offering, and the grain offering. Next week we cover the sin offering and the trespass offering, which were the obligatory, which were basically the fines for the penalties that they made. The same way if we broke the law today, we would have a fine that we would be paying. Can you go back a second? A second? Sure. So you said we today you did we did the burnt offering, which is the first one. Mm -hmm. I thought the second one was a green offering. It is. is, that, is that it doesn't matter the order. Oh. So Why the do you call offering, these three? Why do you call it the meat? Is the peace offering. It's called the meat offering, but so, basically it, 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 it's just it's it's the meal offering. Oh, because it's a Some cereal. call it the okay. cereal offering. Okay. Some so call it the green. grain offering. Meat it was is called King the James. meat. Yeah. Meat is the King King James. King James. Bread was your meat. Yeah, because you would think that the meat offering would be the burnt offering. That makes more sense. Yeah. Than no, than it's just the terminology from the King James. You know, I keep using the King James on it because there's no copyright. So I keep taking stuff from my PowerPoints and throwing it into my book for when I'm doing my research back. So I'm sticking with the King James only because, and I keep editing it a little bit, because of the fact that it has no copyright on it. Right. So there are better translations. Did you just do two chapters? Two chapters and, and Hebrew we did three chapters. Yeah, and so the rest of the time I was in Isaiah and in Hebrews. Yeah. I originally had, I, I had looked at whether I did the volunteer, it was too short. And God had me throw in the Isaiah and the Hebrews. And then, um, and that's kind of a prep for where we're going into when we get to the sin offering and the trespass offering. And then it kind of, we have enough to cover on the sin and the trespass offering next week when we go into it. <coughs> Any questions? Scapegoat. Oh, that's not going to have any time. Scapegoat. We're going to be covering the scapegoat when we get to the Day of Atonement, which is later on in the book. Yes, Jacob. Why do you have um, three offerings on that one and two on that one? See, these ones were voluntary. That was just because you just wanted to give it up to <coughs> your heart. These two were because you screwed up. You did something wrong and now you got to pay the price. Okay? There's always a price to pay. Yeah. So in other words, the, yeah, these were... Usually it's preferable if, you, if you're going to do a voluntary offering. That, that would be the ideal. You know, we don't usually want to fall into the category of the sin offering or the trespass offering, because that means we probably screwed up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you go back to, back to Hebrews uh, 10, 26? Yes. Um, I know we, we all agree that it's a scary thing to fall mm -hmm. in the hands of the hands of God. But here he's, he's speaking to the leaders. Yes. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, different interpretations of this passage. You know, some people think, oh, you know, it's just a warning. Some people think you can be a believer and walk away from your faith. Mm -hmm. um, 
whichever it is, I think that he put it in here for a reason. And I, yes. And I really believe that a lot of us don't think much of it when we continue on. It says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And then it goes on saying, we literally trodden over the sacrifice. So I just, I look at that and I think, and then, and then it says that, that uh, he will judge his people in verse 30, right? Yeah. So, and judgment starts in the house of God. In the house of the Lord. So you add all that up. You know, we always talk about scripture interpreting scripture. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have to be very careful when we call ourselves a believer. Because the minute we do, our accountability goes way, way up. up. That's right. A heathen has no accountability. They're heathens. They're not keeping any of the law. They're basically their destination is death, right. and and so for them to be saved is great because it pulls them from the flames of the fire. But as a believer, so much is given, much more is required. There's an accountability. Yes. Well, then that brings me back to. I always think of <clears throat> believers that are in these churches right now that it's all about grace. Right. Hyper grace. Hypergrace. I use the term hypergrace. And I also take it to people who just, they don't know any better. They're going to these churches, they just don't know any better. They don't have their relationship. They're not seeking out further. And I think, I mean, my my belief is that God will give them grace to a point. Mm -hmm. because, to a point. Because they didn't know. Well, One of those, they don't know what they're doing. Weren't we all there? Yeah. Weren't we yes. all at a oh, point yes. where we didn't know? Yeah. Everybody's and there's stuff I'm sure we don't know right now. So I hope that and we're being given grace right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now next week's on it. I, I cover ignorance is not bliss <laughs> because ignorance is no excuse for the law. But there is a big difference between sinning in ignorance and sinning sinning willfully. And I I cover that next week. All right, any more questions? Yes. Okay. About the battle with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Because everybody has that. Everybody has it, as long as we have this flesh. Yes. As long as we got this flesh, we're going to be good. Because we've been given a new mind. We've been given a new heart. The only thing that's not new yet okay. is this flesh. But we get that in the resurrection. When we get the new flesh, we will no longer be battling then our heart and our mind will be in sync with our flesh. That's what we have to look forward. It's the reason that that's the big hope that we're looking forward to is that resurrection body because when we get it, now we will no longer be fighting with our flesh. Exactly. All right, guys. Oh, it was going to be priest office. It's not. Now next week it's going to be sin offer, uh, sin offering and trans and trespass offering. Yes. Next week's Fourth uh, of July. Are you going oh, to that's right. Study? Next week's Fourth of July. Do you guys want to come back here next week for Fourth of July? I got nothing to do. I got nothing to do. I'll leave it up to you guys. I think I have plans with mom or something. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that settles it. Yeah, yeah, so. Play day. I got plans to play day. Get a there, are, there are going to be a lot of people going to the 4th of July, fireworks, stuff. Things like that. That's why I'm asking. Do you guys want to do it next week? Yes? No? No. No, let's not do it. Okay. All right. We will postpone next week. Okay. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We'll, we'll, uh, I should have it next week. We can hang out, Chauncey. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, well, well, it sounds like more, most people are looking at doing fireworks or something like that for Fourth of July. So we'll postpone next week's, and um, and we'll uh, we'll look towards the following Tuesday. We'll come in back with the sin, sin offering and the trespass offering. You can still hang out with me, though, Steve. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Is fireworks a sin? No. no. You, guys, you, you guys could go with other people who are going to see fireworks. <laughs> Yes. Why is there a tower? Where? There. Oh, down here? Yeah. Well, they're bringing their offerings. 
There's sheep, there's cows. They're bringing them to sacrifice them. Well, I thought you only had to sacrifice a goat. Well, it depends. Some people sacrifice sheep, some sacrifice goats, some sacrifice cows. Some just sacrifice pigeons and doves. Depending on how great their sin was. What does Steve sacrifice a goat? <laughs> But he's like, but that was for Passover. Passover, you have to sacrifice a lamb or goat. So it's different for different reasons, for different ones. The ones we were covering today are just the voluntary offerings. That means just the offerings that you want to do, if you want to do an offering. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We lift up your name. You're an awesome God. Um, minister to our heart, Lord. Uh, show us what you want to show us, Lord. Uh, reveal to us what you want to reveal. Cause us, Father, to move in your spirit, to be obedient, that we might not feed the flesh, but that, Lord, we would please you in everything that we do and say in Jesus' name. Amen.